life a little bit. No? Living life half full. No. Living life how? To the fullest, right? Living life to the fullest. That's what we want to think about tonight. Marianne Winkler was walking along the beach on Amram Island, a German island near the border with Denmark when she found something fascinating. What do you suppose it was? Mm. It was an old bottle that appeared to contain a message. She wasn't able to open the bottle, so she and her husband photographed it, then broke it open and found a note indicating that the bottle had been thrown into the North Sea by the Marine Biological Society of Great Britain more than a hundred years before. The note said, <laughs> this is pretty funny, the note said, should you contact us, we will give you as a reward one shilling. <laughs> Which maybe a hundred years ago was pretty good deal, right? <laughs> But still, that's pretty cool, especially if it was a 100-year-old shilling. Huh? That would have been really good. When Mrs. Winkler contacted the Marine Biological Society in London, they initially had no idea what she was talking about. But after looking into their records, they discovered that one of their scientists, more than 110 years before, had taken 1,100 bottles put them in the North Sea in an experiment to learn more about ocean currents and their patterns. Yeah. Several hundred of them had been found, of course, over the years, but Mariana Winkler had found the oldest message in a bottle ever recovered. At Revelation today, at A New Day is Dawning, we're not studying messages in a bottle, are we? But we are studying an old message. Maybe we could call it a message in the Bible, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Given by God long ago so that we might know God and know his plan for our lives, right? In the book of Revelation, there are three angels with a message targeted for the time in which we live right now. The messages warn us against the beast and his mark. Yes, we've talked about those. They alert us not to get involved in the confusion of Babylon, right? And the first angel's message in Revelation 14, verse 7 says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Hmm? We've been talking about worship, right? Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And so as we look at these things, what is it that makes these messages unique is that they comprise what the Bible calls the everlasting, indeed, the final gospel message to go to planet earth, right? This is it. God's everlasting message, the final message going to earth today. This is God's last day. Good news gospel message, right? And he gives it to us, right? He gives it to us that we might know him and connect to him, right? To be one with him. There's a call in this verse to give God glory, to connect with our creator God, to worship the one who made us, right? The judgment is mentioned. And then above and beyond all that, the Bible says we're better off. We're blessed. We're blessed when we fear God and give glory to him, aren't we? There's that call again in the book given to reveal Jesus to live in reference to God in all that we do, huh? To keep him in mind, 
no matter what we're doing. So how is it that we give glory to God? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever you do, right? Do all to the glory of God, right? Glory to God in all things, yes? But notice that Paul did get specific about some of those things, and he said in terms of eating and drinking, we should be giving glory to God as well, right? It's important to do it in reference to God, giving glory to Him, right? There's a reason he said that. I expect he might have been warning us about the dangers of high cholesterol or he might have been thinking about heart disease. He might have been warning us about other lifestyle conditions. And I think Paul, yeah, I think he had some understanding there that what we put into our bodies affects the function of our minds, right? What we put in has an impact. You are what you eat, right? More and more, scientists are telling us about illnesses that develop because of what we put into our bodies, right? What's interesting is that what we put into our bodies affects the function of our mind emotionally and spiritually, right? And so for people getting ready for Jesus returning to spend eternity with God, that's a pretty important point, right? Because we want to be spiritually as well in relationship with God as we can be, right? So we are all, each one of us, individually, in a battle for our minds, aren't we? So we want to be ready for that battle. And that battle for the mind comes to a head in Revelation 14, verse 9, if anyone worships the beast, right, and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, right? And it goes on to say, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, right? So this is really important here. We're talking about the forehead here. That's representing the mind. That mark of the beast will be placed in the mind, right? We talked about that uh, a few nights ago. And the seal of the living God, also in the mind, right? So there's a battle going on for our minds. Therefore, it's important that our mind be given entirely to God, right? Really important, isn't it? And so even... As a matter of fact, Paul wrote in one place that we should bring back into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, yes? God said in 3 John chapter 2, Beloved, I pray that you may, be, that you may prosper in all things and what? Be in health, yes? Just as your soul prospers. So do you suppose John wanted the souls of those reading his, his book there to prosper? Yes, he wanted an equal prosperity for their physical lives as well, that their health be good as well. So I want you to notice the divinely designed connection between our bodies and our minds, right? between our physical and even our spiritual welfare we see in this verse, right? And so you've heard that phrase a thousand times, I'm sure. Healthy body, healthy mind, right? The Bible, the Bible bears that out even, right? We go back to the experience of Daniel. Now in Daniel's day, Daniel was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, right? plucked from Jerusalem, taken down to Babylon. And when he got to Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar encouraged him to eat the Babylonian food. Uh-oh. Daniel wouldn't do that, would he? He knew that it wasn't good for him. He understood that it would interfere 
with the clear functioning of his mind. So he said, no, I, I'm not going to eat that food. Huh. As a consequence, <laughs> God was then able to use Daniel to receive and transmit some of the most profoundly important communications ever to flow between God and man. Why was God able to use Daniel? Because Daniel was consecrated to God, yes? Everything he did was to glorify God, including what he ate and drank, right? His body was given to God, and his mind functioned at its best so that God could use it as a channel to communicate to the human family, right? So when we think about keeping our bodies for God so that our minds might function best, what do we think of? It appears that if we want to have a well-functioning body and mind, the Christian believer would recognize that it's really not appropriate to use mind-altering drugs, you know, because these illegal drugs cause damage to the mind, right? So it makes sense. If we're preparing for heaven, we're not going to use stuff that's going to hinder us from getting there, right? from understanding what God wants to tell us about how to get there. We're going to stay focused on him and not allow other things to interfere with that focus. Now, somebody might say, oh, well, I take an aspirin or some such. No, that, that's not what we're talking about here, okay, <laughs> right? We're talking about those illegal drugs which bend the brain, right? and alter the mind. They lessen that ability to connect with God, you know? And so those ones that do damage and that damage can even have spiritual ramifications, right? We want to avoid those kinds of things. Now, it's not just illegal substances, right? Know what I mean? <laughs> that can corrupt the mind and damage our ability to communicate with God. There are yeah, even some legal substances, huh? That perhaps, uh, perhaps these are like the low-hanging fruit, right? But it's worth saying that alcohol has a bad effect on the frontal lobe of our brain. That, that decision-making part, right? That part through which the Lord can reach us as we read his word, right? MRIs demonstrate that alcoholics suffer a striking amount of frontal lobe damage. You wouldn't be surprised by that, would you? But what might surprise you is that people who even drink moderately, and that's defined as just one alcoholic drink a week, also suffer impairment of the mind. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's consistent with what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Yes. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise, right? Is not wise. And you and I both know there are a massive amount of people with drinking problems, huh? Consider what the Bible says later in Proverbs in chapter 23. Do not look upon the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Yeah, it's talking about fermented wine, right? Yeah, yeah. At the last, it says, it bites like a serpent. Mm -hmm. Did the Bible know what it was talking about? Yeah and stings like a viper. Yes, your eyes will see strange things. Mm -hmm. And your heart, here's that spiritual connection, your heart will utter perverse things. Yeah. We know that alcohol is dangerous and deadly, don't we? Think of people who die on the roads because of accidents that take place due to people under the influence of alcohol, right? Yeah. And so much domestic violence 
is perpetrated as a result of the use of alcohol, isn't it? Yeah. Prisons are filled with people who committed their crimes while under the influence of alcohol, right? Terrible crimes of immoral nature are committed by people under the influence of alcohol. It's clear that alcohol does damage. Now, someone's going to say, oh, what about Jesus? Didn't Paul tell Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake? Well, yeah, sure he did. But you decide. Would that be grape juice? Or would that be fermented alcohol? You see, people have taken that verse, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake, to mean it's okay to drink beer and, and hard liquor and all kinds of things. Is that really what Paul was telling them to do? No. Paul was not suggesting liquor was the tonic that man needs for his gastrointestinal distress, was he? No. Grape juice? Yeah. Alcohol? No. That is not what was on the mind of the Apostle Paul, right? Now, when it comes to the wedding at Canaan, right? People assume that Jesus turned wine or water into wine, even liquor, maybe, you know? I mean, that it had alcohol in it. One of the reasons is because the governor of the feast drank the wine and he said, ha, huh, this is the best I've ever had. Wait a minute. It doesn't have to be alcoholic for him to think it was the best he'd ever had, does it? No. Let's think about this together. Does it stand to reason that the one who spoke about wine being a mocker, alcohol leading to all kinds of damaging behavior, does it make sense that that one would create 125 gallons of alcohol and say, hey, the drinks are on the house. Doesn't make sense, does it? No. Christ was the one who made the human body. He isn't the one who's going to turn around and encourage people to abuse alcohol. That's not going to happen. Or even to use it and damage what the Bible calls the body temple. Yes? Right? The scriptures don't contradict themselves. Jesus certainly wasn't encouraging the use of alcohol. Read through the scriptures and they are consistent that alcohol just isn't good. Simple. Isaiah made it clear in chapter 65 and verse 8 of his book, as the new wine is found in the cluster, new wine, right? Yes. And notice it goes on. And one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it when it's in the cluster, right? So, God says, I will do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. And so, we see here, there was a blessing in it when it was in the cluster. That means that when it's unfermented, right? Wine that isn't alcohol. You see... One of the challenging things about the Bible when you read the word wine, it doesn't distinguish between alcohol and non-alcoholic wine. It's all just wine. Yayin in Hebrew, oinos in the Greek, with no linguistic differentiation between non-alcoholic and alcoholic in the scriptures. So, we have to go with the context to understand. It gives us very clearly how we ought to read this in the vast majority of cases. So the question isn't, is it right or wrong? Is it God's will or not? Is it good or otherwise? The question is, how do I get away from it? Because we know already from the scripture it's not good. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says in Philippians 4.19. Very important. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need, right? All your need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, right? 
If you feel, as many people do, that you can't go a day without alcohol a week, you can't imagine the rest of your life without alcohol. Remember, remember that God has the power, yes? God has the power to supply your need and give you the victory over these things. The victory you need in your life to get rid of that stuff, right? A story came out recently about a media personality who got into his senior years and discovered he had cirrhosis of the liver. Yeah, which was going to kill him. He'd been a good time guy, woohoo, who always liked to drink. Unfortunately for him, the drink never liked him. You know, God's plan is he doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't even want us to pretend that a little is okay. No, that's not it. God says, I can help you with that. If you need victory, I can provide victory for you. There's no question about this. God can do it in your life. Another thing that damages the frontal lobe is nicotine. An enormous percentage of deaths in the United States every year, in fact, in any part of the Western world, is caused by, yes, smoking, nicotine, yes. Medical researchers at Sloan Kettering Institute of Cancer Research in New York City say that every cigarette you smoke shortens your life by 14 and a half minutes. A sign at an airport said, every minute you smoke is a minute less that you live. That's pretty serious. Insurance companies will tell you that non-smokers live on average 14 years longer than smokers. Now it's true, there is no commandment that says, thou shalt not smoke. It's true. You look through it, nothing here says, thou shalt not smoke, all right? However, there is a commandment that says, thou shalt not kill, and smoking is just self-killing. It is very slow, drawn out, and in the end, painful. But it's still killing yourself. I watched it, as I mentioned a few nights ago. I watched it happen to my grandfather. I saw my father suffer with emphysema. And I'll be honest, I'll be honest. I'm no, no, no genius guy, duh. I smoked too for a while, all right? We all make mistakes, huh? But I can tell you, God wants you to live a better life, not just half full, he wants you to live life to the fullest, yes? To the fullest. There are dozens of carcinogens in cigarette smoke, and they do immense damage to the organs, even ones that God intended to communicate with us through, right? Now, I don't need to talk to you about how bad this is because the Surgeon General has been telling us about it forever, right? <laughs> He's been telling us it's no good. And I certainly don't want you to feel condemned. Like I said, I did it. You know, if, you, if you've smoked before, yeah, we're, we're in this together. We're trying to help each other, right? <laughs> we're trying to help each other up, not beat each other down. That's not the point here. We want to get better at this, right? We want to get closer to Jesus. Get rid of the stuff that's holding us back. That's all. That's it. We want to grow together, yes? And so here's the key, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. Who does what? Strengthens me, yes. How many things can we do? All things, right? Yes, yes. Oh, but you say, I can do all things except get rid of cigarette smoking. Is that what it says? No. I can do all things except no more chewing tobacco. No, no excepts. Right, right. 
How many things can I do? All things, right? All things, yes. Through who? Through my strength and ability, my gutting it out, right? Is that what it's about? No, it's through Christ. Get on your knees. Ask the Lord for the help, right? That's what it is. Yes, Christ gives us strength, right? He gives us strength. Now, okay, here we go. Are you ready? Going to meddle just a little bit. Are you ready? Got your steel toe shoes on? Here we go. I'm doing it out of love. Come on now. I'm trying to help. I mentioned nicotine, right? Yeah. There's another een. <laughs> That's pretty well getting a free pass these days, isn't it? You know what I mean? Uh, I want to mention caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. Caffeine is not neutral. It's not neutral. It's harmful because it also disrupts the chemistry in our brains because it tangles with the neurotransmitters that keep your brain in balance. It leads to a wide variety of illnesses and disorders and even, in many cases, depression. Caffeine doesn't help. Medical experts are clear about this. Johns Hopkins School of Medicine said some time ago, caffeine is the world's most widely used what? What? Mind-altering drug. Yes. Dr. James Lane from Duke University said, what we have found is that caffeine interacts with stress and does what? Intensifies it. Yes. You think you need it to bring you down, but when you use it, it actually amps you up. Uh, right? Yeah. Put it in your gas tank. There you go. <laughs> and when your body is going through some turmoil, that's just your body trying to get back in balance where it should be. It's telling you, you shouldn't have put that caffeine into it in the first place. Right? Caffeine, unfortunately, is the drug of choice for 9 out of 10 Americans. Yikes. Now the question is this. Should Christians be addicted to drugs? No. The only thing we ought to be addicted to is the Bible, right? The Spirit of God. The presence of Jesus in our lives, right? That's what we need to be addicted to, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus gave us an example concerning this. He was on the cross. He's in great pain, hmm? right? You can imagine. And they brought him a sponge on the end of a stick, right? And we read that in that sponge there was some vinegar, mm, but it was mixed with gall. It was something to designed to numb the pain, to, to, to make him not as clear-headed, yeah. Well, was that kind of them? He was in excruciating pain. No, it wasn't. They just wanted him to be able to endure more torture on the cross. Jesus tasted and he said, I know what that is. And he didn't drink it. Because while he was hanging on that cross, he knew that he needed the tightest possible connection with his father. He needed that. He couldn't consume anything that was going to have a terrible effect on his ability to communicate with his father and hear his father's voice. He gave us an example that we should follow in his steps. Yes, Christ's example is a powerful one. If he could go through it on the cross under those conditions for you and I, Maybe you can make it through the day <sighs> without the caffeine, huh? <laughs> All right? You know what I mean? Revelation 22, verse 4 tells us that God's character ought to be formed in our minds. So if you want the character of God in your mind, 
you're going to be doing nothing that would damage your mind, right? And give you a lesser opportunity to hear and discern the voice of God, right? You're going to want to listen. We want to give ourselves every advantage. So if it's alcohol you're hooked on, or nicotine that's made a slave out of you, or caffeine that's running your life, we can remember tonight that there's somebody in heaven right now acting as our high priest. He's there for us, willing to help us through all of this. There was one who died on the cross to give us victory, yes? Christ is more powerful than any addiction. Jesus can give us victory, yes? Over any negative, destructive habit. He can do it. He can do it. And he wants to do it if you'll let him give you the victory. Now you might ask, whose business is it other than mine? It's my body. Hmm? Yeah, I'll do whatever I want with it. Well, hold on just a second. Hold on. The Bible has news for you. It's not your body after all. <laughs> we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of whom? Holy the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, right? Yes. And it goes on, for you were bought with a price, right? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to him. Why did Jesus come into the world? Why did he come into this world? John 10, verse 10. I have come that they might have life. life. Yes, he has come to give us life. He doesn't want us involved in the things that bring suffering, pain, and death. That's not what he wants. He is the life giver from the beginning. He is the creator. He is the re-creator, yes? He wants to make us fully his body, mind, and spirit, yes? All given to him. Jesus came to give us the good life. I want that good life, don't you? I want that. He wants to keep us from harming ourselves. Come back with me a little to the book of Exodus and notice the promise God made to the children of Israel as they departed from Egypt. God said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, right? In His sight. Not my sight. What will happen? We give ear to his commandment and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Yeah, I told you I smoked, you know, right? But it's been decades since I quit smoking. You know, and when I go to the doctor and they said, oh, when did you quit smoking? And I tell them it was decades ago. They, oh, OK, never mind. Yeah, the Lord who heals us, right? It's 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 as though almost that I didn't smoke at all because I've gone so far since that time. The Lord has been working to help me. And so good things are happening there. Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> And so when Israel left Egypt, they left behind a nation that was full of people groaning under the weight of illness and disease. Tests even performed on Egyptian mummies show that the Egyptians were suffering from modern lifestyle diseases. It's amazing, isn't it? They had cancer, heart disease, diabetes, tooth decay. 
one too many t Twinkies or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were suffering from stress. Oh, I got to get to this meeting, right? And God says, if you follow me, you'll avoid all that. You'll be healthy. You'll be well. You won't have these diseases. We're trying to figure out how to get a grip on the health care crisis in this country, right? God had it figured out years ago. <laughs> years ago. The problem is we're listening to everybody except God, right? Yeah. If you were to buy a new car, it would come with something in the glove box, right? The owner's manual, exactly. And the owner's manual would say, if you want this car to run optimally, run it with this kind of fuel, this kind of oil, the tires should be inflated to this pressure or whatever. I suppose then you wouldn't be pulling up to the station needing fuel and go, hey, let's try kerosene today. You're not going to do that, are you? Because you know you would want to follow the owner's manual, right? That way you know the car would run at its best. For believers, here's your owner's manual, right? Here's your owner's manual. God told us how we run best, right? We want to be looking at the owner's manual. God says to us in Revelation 14, verse 7, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water, right? And so we are living in the judgment hour. There's a call for us to give glory to God in all things, right? Including what we eat and what we drink, right? We can't give glory to God if we're destroying the high point of his creation. Human beings, right? Ourselves. The trouble many of us have. Yeah. The trouble many of us have is that we're digging our graves with our teeth. Yes. Yeah. It's important for us today to do something about this. And thank the Lord, in many cases, we can, right? We can. You know St. Paul was familiar with the ancient games, what we would call today the Olympic games, right? And with reference to them, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way, what? That you may obtain it. You want to get it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. Temperate in all things. What does that mean? Temperate means that you get rid of the things that are bad for you, and you use only in moderation the things that are good for you, right? Because you can even overdose on water if you want to, you know? We have to be careful in all ways, right? We want to listen to what God has told us. And so we want to be temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. What about us? What about us? We for what? imperishable crown. We're not in this race just to get the crowd to clap and cheer on our behalf. We're here to win eternity, aren't we? What are these guys willing to give up in order to get the crowd to cheer for them? And how much more valuable is it for us to have eternal life? You follow where I'm going with this? Does that make sense to you? You don't see many Olympic-bound athletes getting their training meal at McDonald's. Doesn't happen too often, does it? They have coaches and nutritionists and advisors and trainers. They dedicate their lives to winning one little gold medal. 
and they're lucky if they get that, right? So why would we, who are believers in God, aspiring citizens of heaven, put anything less into getting eternal life, right? Paul is saying, if you're running, run to win. Yes, yes, throw yourself into it. Give yourself the best chance you can to win this race. If we're planning on everlasting life, Paul says, we need to live now like we're planning on it, right? God gave us a great start back in Genesis 1.29. See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food, right? In the Garden of Eden, there were no butcher shops, right? If you had gone to Walmart <laughs> in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> you wouldn't have found a meat section, right? There was no death. There were no killings of animals to get food. God gave them a plant-based diet in the Garden of Eden. That was God's original plan, right? That was his plan. Did it work? Mm -hmm. Genesis 5.27, so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. That guy lived a little longer than I'm going to, I'll bet you. Right? Yeah. 969 years. But from Methuselah's day to our day, yeah, big change, right? Massive change. Now, there is wisdom in what God said very clearly. People live long, healthy lives right back then. So what happened then? We come down to the book of, or we come down to the time of Noah. There was some change there, wasn't there? You read this in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. You shall take with you seven of each clean animal, a male and his female, to each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Wait, hold on a minute. I thought we were told when we were kids the animals went into the ark two by two, right? What's this? What's this? What's with this seven thing? Yeah, they did go in two by two, but also they didn't. How, how is that? Some did go in by twos, didn't they? Yeah, which ones were that? The unclean, exactly, yes. Those were the unclean. And the ones that went by sevens? The clean, yes. These were the animals described by the Bible as clean animals. And so after the flood... Noah couldn't just come out of the ark, wander out to his watermelon patch or his olive grove and get the food that he needed, right? Wasn't going to happen for him. There was a scarcity of food. So God said, you may eat the animals, the clean animals, if you choose. And having seven of the clean animals meant he was able also to offer sacrifice to God when he got off the ark. You couldn't have offered as a sacrifice one of the unclean animals because then they'd have been gone, right? Yes, exactly. They would have been gone. It would have been over. Noah certainly wasn't going to eat the unclean animals, so there were unclean by twos and the cleans by sevens, right? Now, I want you to notice the distinction that exists there, the distinction between clean and unclean animals. It predates the nation of Israel. If you get to talking to people about unclean foods, they'll tell you, oh, that's just a Jewish thing. Really? Huh. There were no Jews on Noah's Ark. Not even one, right? <laughs> this was hundreds and hundreds of years before there was any Jews on the planet, right? And so this issue had to do with your health and well-being. It was not a national 
nationalistic distinction in any way in any stretch of the imagination, right? We read in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 3, among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat, right? If you go into verse 4, you'll read about camels, yeah. Now, I know this comes as a shock to you. I know you just went out and bought a side of camel at the butcher shop last night, planning on some big camel sandwiches or camel burgers or something. No? You didn't, you didn't do that? No? No? A camel doesn't split the hoof, right? A camel does chew the cud, but unfortunately it has a pad for a foot, not a hoof, all right? So God said, mm-mm. No camel, all right? He mentions in Leviticus 11 also rabbits and other kinds of animals as well. They aren't to be eaten either. They are unclean. The one that comes to mind as the biggest challenge for us, though, I think, is in verse 7. The Bible says, and the swine, yes, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the cud. It is unclean to you, yes. Now, I recognize that this one probably is a shock for some people, right? But when you look at it from a medical perspective, you discover that God is trying to do the very best for us. God is really trying to protect us. He created the animals but not all of them were created to be eaten, right? One reason God said that about the little oinkers (laughs) is that ounce for ounce, pork contains more fat than almost any other meat out there. Yeah, yeah, that people would eat. And if you put pork under a microscope, this is kind of chilling, so maybe close your ears, yeah. This is a little scary. Don't be surprised if you find evidence of trichina larvae. Yeah, the trichina worm. Yeah. They can burrow into your body and cause great discomfort and can cause you to think you've got a wide variety of illnesses when in fact it's just the food that you ate that God said in the first place, You shouldn't be eating. Some years ago, a news report aired about a lady in Arizona who had a problem with her head, headaches and pain. They examined her and said, we're sorry, you've got a brain tumor, you know? They operated on that lady to remove the brain tumor and discovered, yeah, it wasn't a tumor. There was a live worm burrowing into her brain, yes, as a result of her eating pork, yeah. They'll tell you when you eat pork, cook it well done. Why is that? It's to kill stuff like worms in it, exactly, yes. This is why God said, to begin with, avoid all of that. Don't take the chance. I'll keep you from the diseases that came on the Egyptians. Again, it's not just the Jews. This will still be important when Jesus comes again. Let's read in Isaiah 66. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord will be many. Those who sanctify themselves, right? Oh, it's okay. I'll be all right. Huh? Yeah? Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after the idol in the midst, eating what? Swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse. Yes. Yes. Uh, Shall be consumed together, says the Lord, yes, 
So God puts Miss Piggy in the same category as Mickey Mouse. Yeah. And you're not going to add mice, I'm guessing, to your stir fry, are you? No. You're not going to do that. And God says that the hog is in the same category as the mouse. Leviticus 11, 9 and 10 refers to sea creatures or those things that live in the water, right? And what it says is this, these you may eat of all that are in the water, whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But of, in all the seas or in all the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination. Whoa. An abomination to you. Now that's pretty strong language, wouldn't you agree? There's nothing in the Bible that God once denounced as an abomination that it later says, oh, I've changed my mind. That's not an abomination anymore. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Not long ago, people decided they wanted to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. I fished in the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, they needed to clean it up. <laughs> so guess what they put in the water? Oyster farms. Oyster farms, yes, yes. And the water quality improved because a filter feeder, like the oysters, they suck in the dirty water, keep the impurities along with the things that they can digest, right, within itself, and then they spit out cleaner water, cleaning up the environment. That's why the Lord made them, you know. They are marvels of nature. They weren't designed to be eaten. They had a job to do. God gave them work, and they do a really, really good thing for the environment, you know. Uh, but feeding you and me was not why they were put there, okay? Some of those sea creatures are also scavengers. When Navy divers are training, they are told that they should look for the line of crabs. Hmm. When recovering a body. That's because sea creatures sometimes feed on dead matter. It was never God's plan for us to put that in our mouths. It doesn't under God, and it does a considerable amount of harm. And then the Bible says in verse 13, And these things shall you regard as an abomination among the birds, and they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, and the buzzard. Doesn't that look tasty? Uh, no, no, right? But think about it. Think about how we normally go about talking. We say things like, oh, that smells good. Oh, let's get something good to eat. And we're not talking about things that are healthy, are we? Uh-uh. Yeah. No, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. When that happens, we're not being guided by our higher thoughts, we're being guided by something else, right? We're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Instead, we're being guided by our own desires, right? Yeah, which can lead to an early grave. Now we wonder, did this not change when Jesus died on the cross? Now let's think about that for just a minute. Take a pig on the day before Jesus died on the cross. There he is. Keep your eyes on that pig. And when Jesus died on the cross, it's the same pig. The pig hasn't changed, has it? It hasn't changed at all. It was bad for you to eat before. It's bad for you now. Jesus died, and if I'm reading my Bible correctly, he died to cleanse sinners, right? Yes, 
I don't read any mention anywhere of Jesus dying to cleanse pigs. Not there, is it? No. Now you may be thinking, oh, come on, that's a Jewish thing. Ha! Is there some difference between a Jewish stomach and a Gentile stomach? <laughs> right? Right? No difference. Good health is for all people at all times, right? God is trying to preserve us, to bless us, to get us out of this world doing the best we can, not full of sickness and disease and death. That's not what God wants. He wants to get us into the world to come with our minds intact, our bodies not suffering. God doesn't want that for us. We want every possible advantage, don't we? Everything that God can do for us. And when God says, that's just not my will for you, yeah, it can take a little adjusting. I get it. I understand that. Oh, I'm in the habit. I've been doing this for years. I, I don't know how I... I get it. I understand. But when you become a believer in Jesus, you let go of some things, don't you? You let go of a lot of stuff. And we're happy to see it go, huh? <laughs> yeah. And even if you weren't glad, you surrendered to Jesus and you prayed the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done, right? Your will be done. And you can afford to say that to God. Lord, I, I kind of like that old catfish, you know? But not my will, your will be done, right? Lord, I don't know how I'm going to live without my cigarettes. But not my will. Your will be done. I've been drinking all these years. But not my will. Your will be done. Yes? That's what we want to do. That's the prayer we pray until we come to the place in our experience that we love doing God's will so much that it comes natural to us, right? And we wouldn't want to turn our backs on God for anything in the world. God wants to grow us and grow us and prepare us for eternity, yes? That's what God wants us to have. Now, there is one passage in the Bible that we need to look at in reference to this. It's, it's that with that, you know, with a lot of subjects... You, you cover from A to Y, right? And, and the Bible's very clear. We've seen it, right? Uh, but then there's that little, that little Z down there, right? <laughs> it's that one little Z. And if it's different from A through Y, then we think, oh, see, there it is. That, that takes care of it. Throw out all that other stuff because I got B. Is that how this works? Hmm, yeah, yeah. Now that Z I'm referring to is the vision Peter had in Acts chapter 10, right? Where God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Yeah, um, I'm guessing giraffes don't have split hooves. What do you think? Elephants either. Hippos, maybe? No, I don't think so, right? And so... Here it is. We're going to look at Acts chapter 10, all right? We'll start with verse 9. The next day, it says, As they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's noon, about lunchtime. People were on their way coming to see Peter. The people who had been sent to him came from a man named Peter. Cornelius, he was an Italian. He was a Gentile. Yeah, Gentile, not a Jew, okay? That's very important to this story. So then it goes on in the scriptures and says, then he, meaning Peter, 
became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat, right? But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, notice that Peter didn't know what this meant. He was wondering, scratching his head. The next verse says, Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the man who had been sent from Cornelius, had made inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate, and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. Now this is absolute proof that nothing changed about the diet when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross was years before this, and Peter still clearly had no intention of eating unclean meat, right? If there had been a change, why in the world didn't Peter know about it, right? <laughs> You'd think he would be one of the very first to find out. He didn't know because there hadn't been any change made. That's pretty obvious. So, what was taking place here then? Peter was a Jew. God wanted the gospel to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, right? But Peter like problem, or pe people like Peter had a problem. You know what that problem was? Yes, he was a racist. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> Peter thought, uh-uh, I'm not going over there to preach to some Gentiles. Mm -mm. A Jew? Sure. Not a Gentile. Gentiles were considered at the time unclean. Yes. So what God did was he sent a vision. Now, I don't want you to think that racism is confined to any one geographical location in the world or that it's a recent phenomenon or it's only one kind of... No, no, it's not. Here was Peter as prejudiced and as racist as anybody else. So what did God do? He gave him a dream in which he said, the unclean stuff, that's not unclean now. Rise up, kill it, eat it. It's yours. Of course, Peter didn't understand that I can't eat that. That's not God's will. God sent a vision and spoke to him. He finally got it. When he finally went to Cornelius' house, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, it says, Then he said to them, You know that it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company or to go to one who is of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any pig common or unclean. Is that what Peter understood because of this vision that he'd seen of all these animals let down? Is that it? Is that what he told Cornelius? I shouldn't call any pig unclean. Is that what he realized was being taught from this vision? No, that's not what it's about. God hath shown me, he said, that I should not call any man, yes, I should not call any man common or unclean. He realized his prejudice was wrong. He realized that. Verse 34 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows 
no partiality. Wow. Do we serve a good God or what? And he's growing all of us, isn't he? Yeah, he's growing all of us, even Peter, right? Later on in the book of Acts, Peter rehearses the same vision again when he reported it to his brethren, telling them that God had opened the way for the gospel to the Gentiles. Very clear. This isn't about clean and unclean foods. It's about how we treat people, that we need to be right with everybody. Yes, nothing to do with diet, nothing to do with what's on the menu. That hadn't changed. This had everything with how we treat our brothers, right? So God was trying to say here to Peter, Peter, you and your nationalistic distinctions, man, let them go. That's not my way. And Peter finally got it figured out and said, praise the Lord, right? In Psalm 84, verse 11, the word of God says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God doesn't want you to feel that you're getting ripped off as though God was taking away all the good stuff. He won't withhold any good thing from those who love him and walk uprightly. He wants for you the best of the best, yes? Yes, nothing less than the good stuff. He doesn't want you to have just those things that are good for you. He wants the best and nothing that harms you, right? The enemy of souls is the one who wants to ruin us, isn't it? Yes, God has the perfect plan. The devil has a counterfeit. We've seen it again and again on this series, haven't we? Right? God offers good health. He says, follow these guidelines. You'll be blessed. You'll live longer. Did you know that science shows that these people who follow these guidelines live longer and have fewer health problems? It's true. Considerably longer and significantly fewer. That's science. That's God's plan. Oh, but the devil says, if you want it, have it. If you like it, grab it. If you need it, take a hold of it. Yeah, if you feel like somebody's wanting to rain on your parade, just ignore them. Oh, smell how good that smells. Yeah, oh, oh, see how good it tastes. Yeah, oh, just live to please yourself. That's the devil talking. That's the devil talking. And God says, don't let your taste buds be your final authority. You don't want to be wrestling with heart disease that you don't need to have, right? Why cancer? Do you want diabetes, stroke, when you can avoid some of that stuff? No, we want our minds to be brought into captivity to Christ, yes? We want God's will done in our lives because he wants the best for us. That's important. Jesus came to give us a more abundant life, right? And he was serious about that. What a privilege, isn't it? Think about it. We're getting ready to go to heaven. Heaven. Can you imagine walking on streets of gold? Can you imagine plucking the fruit from the tree of life? Wow, that'll be awesome, won't it? We'll grow forever in the grace of Jesus. God wants us to get ready for that right now, huh? Right now. Yes. He says, remove all the roadblocks you possibly can. He wants us to be with him forever, right? That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, right? Your bodies even, a living sacrifice. Is it a sacrifice for you if you don't give something up? 
That's no sacrifice if you're not giving it something up. If I ask you to give the Lord $5, is that a sacrifice for me? No. <laughs> right? The only time we make a sacrifice is when we give up something. The Lord is asking us to give our bodies a living sacrifice. And that will be holy, acceptable to God. And it is our reasonable service, right? Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world. We don't eat like the world. We don't drink like the world. We don't get soda pop like the world, you know? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, right? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove. We're going to prove this. We're going to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, right? Remember what Jesus said. Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Give it all. Lay it all on the altar. Let Jesus have all of you, everything. Yeah, even what's on your plate, right? even that which goes into your body, even that which is inside your mind, which also goes to what we watch on TV, right? We want to be watching things that will lead us to heaven, right? Now I've really gone to meddling, huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> but isn't it true? God wants to have all of you, right? All of you. Because when he has all of you, you have all of him, right? He has you, yes. I'm reminded of what happened a few years ago in a slot canyon in Utah. A young man named Aaron Ralston was out hiking. No one knew where he was. He was hiking alone when a boulder dislodged and pinned him. Now, you can't just push a boulder off. It's a boulder. It's huge, right? All he had was a dull pocket knife. Oh, uh, yeah, you know what's coming, don't you? Yeah. It was a matter of lef life and death because no one was ever going to find him there. So he went to work. By the time he was done, he was minus an arm. Yeah. Yeah. It was a radical decision, wasn't it? Yeah, but he got out of there with his life, right? Do you need to make a decision like that today? Is there something that needs to be cut off from your life today? Is there something you need to surrender to Jesus? If there is, now's the time, isn't it? Now's the time. Make the decision to yield your whole life to God. In fact, let's pray about it because he has strength, doesn't he? And he's willing to help us. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful that you are the creator, the one who made us in the beginning and you've given us the owner's manual. You own us, and you've given us this manual to tell how to take care of ourselves. And science is even confirming that it's best for us that we live as you have told us to live. But Lord, sometimes eh, we've, uh, we've put in the wrong things sometimes. Maybe we've even gotten used to that. Maybe we've even gotten dependent on it. Oh, I just can't wake up without that cup of coffee in the morning. But we know, because we read in your word today, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, we want to claim that promise tonight for these things that as we kneel down 
in the garden of Gethsemane next to Jesus and say, not my will, but your will be done. That we can know tonight that you will give us strength, that we can take that last bunch of cigarettes, grind them under our foot, throw them away, and say, I know Jesus will give me the victory. That you are there for us, Lord. And we ask for that tonight, knowing that you will do more for us than we can ask or think. You don't necessarily promise that it'll be easy, but you do promise that as we stay close to you, you will give us the victory. And so we pray that you will be with us in making those decisions tonight to get rid of some stuff. And indeed, Lord, it's, it's not an arm that's good for us. We found out these things aren't good for us. And so help us to cut loose from them and choose tonight to live life to the fullest. And we will give you the glory throughout eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, tomorrow is Thursday. We will not be here tomorrow night, but Friday night, we pick it up. Friday night, 7 o'clock. Ooh, this one's serious. The fall of Babylon. Wow. We'll see you right here Friday night, 7 o'clock. Thanks so much.